Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special lecture series on international business and regional studies. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for International Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Today's program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, a gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for past six years and sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures and movie screenings. LMU is among the 16 universities in the country who received prestigious cyber grants awards from the U.S. Department of Education. The LMU CYBE grants CYBE serves as a regional as well as national resources to students, faculty, and business pr practitioners through international business and area study education, foreign language training, and research capacities. Today, we have a great program for you. Uh, we are very fortunate to have two experts on the key issues involving the U.S. and Korea. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the U.S. and Republic of Korea, or South Korea Alliance, which is considered as one of the most successful partnerships that has overcome many hardships and troubles over the past seven decades. President Noon of South Korea paid a state visit to the U.S. last April to commemorate this special occasion. Since 1953, when the U.S. and Korea signed their mutual defense treaty, the two countries continued to broaden the traditional security alliance to encompass economic and technological cooperation. A signed Korea-U.S. free trade agreement, often called Coros FTA in 2012, to expand exports and imports. The US is the second largest trading partner of South Korea after China, and South Korea is the seventh largest trading partner of the US when including both goods and service trade. In the face of growing geopolitical divide, reminiscent of the Cold War era, the partnership between the two countries has elevated from a bilateral coalition to global comprehensive strategic alliance. Today, we'll learn more about this new emerging partnership from the two experts. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers. First, Dr. Andrew Yaw. He's a senior fellow and SK Korea Foundation chair at the Brookings Institution's Center for East Asia Policy Studies. He's also a professor of politics at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. He's the author of numerous books on topics covering North Korea and regional alliance issues in Asia. His most recent book titled State, Society, and Markets in North Korea was published by Cambridge University Press in 2012, 2021. Dr. Yao is currently working on a project that examines South Korea's role in the Indo-Pacific region and how South Korea can support a rules-based order outside its traditional focus on Northeast Asia. His research also covers the Indo-Pacific strategies of the US and its allies, Asia's regional architecture and institutional change, and the US grand strategy and force posture. Our next guest speaker, Mr. Troy Stengren is a senior director and fellow at the Korea Academic Institute of America, often abbreviated as KEI. At KEI, he focuses on issues pertaining to U.S.-Korea relations, South Korea's foreign and economic policy, and North Korea. He's a post-co visiting fellow at the East-West Center in Hawaii between 2018 and 2019, and a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs fellow in South Korea from 2012 to 2013. Mr. Stangron is also the, a columnist for the Korea Times and a contributing author for The Diplomat. He's also a member of the International Council of Korean Studies Board and the Korea America Student Conference's National Advisory Committee and the Korea North Korea Academic Forum 
Steering Committee. Troy and Andrew, thank you so much for joining the panel today. It's been more than two years since we had a program in Korea with Dr. Cha of the CSIS. Now, I'd like to ask each of you to give a brief overview of the current state of the US and South Korea Alliance for about eight to 10 minutes. Then we'll start a panel discussion for about 15 minutes or so before taking questions from the audience. Andrew, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Peck. It's a real pleasure to speak uh, with the community at Loyola Marymount University. And I have been, I have visited campus there as pre-pandemic. And I remember seeing that beautiful backdrop that you have by the coast. I also want to give a shout out to uh, my fellow panelist, Troy Stanger, and I'll just embarrass him for one second, but uh, I still remember my first professional travel uh, to Korea was in 2009. Uh, it was a trip uh, hosted by the Asia Foundation. Try, I don't know if you remember this, but we were both on that trip. And uh, it's actually rare for anyone to be in the same institution uh, in Washington, DC for a long time yet. Uh, Troy is still at KI. I'm still a professor at Catholic University in addition to my uh, Brookings post, which is newer, but it's just, I feel, I'm just pleased and, <laughs> honored to still be around and to share the stage with Troy again after all these years. So, um, so I'm really delighted to be here. But for our topic today, I'm gonna share my um, screen. I have a few slides uh, that I think may be helpful. Um, hopefully, uh, let's see if... Uh, okay, I think that should be the full full screen is uh is that sharing or uh no, we, yeah. we can see it okay good yeah. um you know I, I only have now probably only eight minutes to talk about uh the alliance and its formation and to talk a little bit about the security dimension i know troy will talk about uh more of the economic dimension but as uh dr uh, Peck said, this is the 70th anniversary of the U.S.-South Korea alliance, and there are very few things that last when it comes to relationships 70 years. I mean, the divorce rate in uh, the U.S. is still over 50 percent, so uh, 70 years is pretty amazing. But I want to make three points about this alliance. Um, the first is that the alliance is a living and dynamic institution, meaning that it changes and it adapts over time. And the day that it stops uh, adapting, is when we know that it's outlived its usefulness. So it, the alliance in 2023 is very different from what it was in 1953. Um, the second point I wanna make is that the alliance was designed for a broader purpose than the Korean Peninsula. When we think about US-South Korea alliance, we think of the defense of South Korea and the Korean Peninsula, but the alliance is much more, but this was actually a part of the design and I'll, I'll point that out in a couple of minutes. And then lastly, uh, there are always these issues of trust and lingering trust. And I know Dr. Peck will tease out that question or that point in the Q&A. Um, and I'll say that that's actually quite normal and healthy. All relations, all alliance relationships, even the strongest relationships, let's think of US, UK or United States and Germany. From time to time, there are these issues of trust. I think you just have to manage that within a bandwidth so that it doesn't uh, if there are these issues of lingering trust, you do have to address them. If not, um, the alliance begins or the relationships begin to fall apart. So those are the uh, three key broad points. But if I were to start from the very beginning, of course, uh, the U.S.-South Korea alliance emerged from the throes of the Korean War. This was a period of, of great uncertainty, of geopolitical tension. It was still the early years of the Cold War. Um, the U.S. Uh, didn't quite understand um, how uh, the Cold War and communism in Asia would uh, play out. But the Korean War really mobilized the U.S. to take um, the Cold War much more seriously. And so out of this war, you, you know, the U.S., uh, of course, the U.S. came to and the U.N. forces came to defend South Korea. But uh, after the armistice was signed, which South Korea never signed. So technically uh, many argue that we're still at war, but after the signing of the armistice uh, on October 1st, 1953, the US and South Korea signed this mutual defense treaty, which would guarantee um, 
you know, as it says, the United States accepts the right to dispose United States land, air, and sea forces in and about the, his territory of the Republic of Korea. And there is another uh, memorandum that was signed the following year that talked about U.S. Uh, troop presence and also bases and so the U.S. military commitment to South Korea. And that's still the bedrock and the core uh, of the U.S.-South Korea alliance today. So it's something that evolves out of the Korean War. Um, but uh, the main purpose of the alliance, of course, was to deter North Korea from trying to attack South Korea again, so to deter another North Korean invasion. And of course, if they were to ever um, attack again, the U.S. would help defend a South Korea. So deterrence and defense uh, were the key points about the alliance. And of course, to be able to deter effectively, you need to uh, demonstrate commitment. And a credible commitment is what they like to call it in, um, in international relations. And they did this by aligning U.S. troops along the border. So it was known as the tripwire strategy. So if North Korea invades again and comes uh, across uh, the 38th parallel, that they would immediately encounter U.S. forces. And so the U.S. would uh, fight back. Um, other things include the the UN command and the Combined Forces Command, which integrates the chain of commands between the South Korean and the US military. That's a very unusual arrangement. It means that uh, now, at least in, in wartime, uh, if, if war were to break out, if North Korea were to invade, uh, South Korean forces would fall under the chain of command of, of the US, uh, a four-star US general. Um, so this is quite unique in the world of, of international relations and other commitments include uh, ongoing US, uh, US military presence. And so the numbers you know, tend to fluctuate, but it's still around 28,500 troops. So these are, uh, this is a commitment that the United States has made to defend uh, South Korea. Um, so that's the, the chief role of the alliance. But over time, you know, things have changed. I mentioned that alliances are living institutions, that they're dynamic. And, you know, if you think about 1953, the the alliance was so much more asymmetric back then because Korea was a poor, a very poor, a weak country. And, and so, you know, often the United States dictated the terms. Now, the U.S. may still be the dominant power here, but as South Korea began to develop, as it began to grow economically, um, you know, there's there are questions about the U.S. commitment, and this really happens with uh, with two events. So in the 1990s, you have democratic, or in 1987, you have South Korean democratization, and in 19 uh, in the early 1990s, you have the collapse of the Cold War, and so this allows for more opinions or more voices to grow about the alliance. You begin to see protests against the U.S. You see complaints about inequities in the alliance. And so this is the period, the 1990s and the 2000s, where you had a lot of changes happening institutionally. Uh, there's uh, shifts in terms of the role of, of um, the operational control. So I mentioned that the U.S. had control of the chain of command and back originally in, in peacetime and wartime, but then peacetime uh, operational control transferred back to the Koreans. Um, they revised something known as the Status of Forces Agreement, which allowed for more equities when it came to uh, incidents and crimes that were committed by U.S. soldiers that they would be tried under more cases in a South Korean court rather than within like a U.S. military um, judicial system. Uh, but because of some of the tensions that emerged in the alliance, there was a series of uh, talks known as the Future of the Alliance talks. There's nine rounds, I believe. And this is all just to uh, suggest that the alliance was changing, that South Korea was a much different country by the end of the Cold War and in the post-Cold War period than it was in 1953. And so that's where you had a recalibration um, of the alliance. And so by the time you get to 2009, I think there's a new understanding about where the U.S.-South Korea alliance is. So the two presidents back then, President Obama and President Lee myung bak they signed or they had this agreement known as the U.S.-South Korea Joint Vision Statement, which talked about a much more future-oriented alliance that was that had gone beyond just security, but would 
address politics, economics, social, and cultural issues as well. This was all part of the lines. It was no longer just about defense uh, and security. And so this is, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that these were some of the issues that they addressed, global health, climate change, supply chain resilience, emerging technologies. So these are issues that they probably would have never thought of in 1953, but over time, the Alliance again has expanded in scope and in focus uh, in terms of functions. And so when we think about the Alliance today, I think we've, we're at a place where now South Korea is ready to contribute, to think about the Alliance beyond just the Korean Peninsula. And that's where we get into this current South Korean president, President Yoon sung yeol his foreign policy. He's come up with an Indo-Pacific strategy. He's talked about upholding a rules-based international order. He talks about global engagement. And this just shows you how far the South Koreans have come. Uh, and this, uh, obviously creates new synergies and dynamics with the United States, because these are the sorts of things that the United States likes to see, values, uh, global engagement, upholding a rules-based um, international order. Now, I said that the alliance to expand in terms of function and also in terms of regional scope. This is something that I noticed in preparation for this lecture when I actually read the Mutual Defense Treaty. There's a preamble, or it's I would call it the preamble, but it's before the actual articles. and Three times they mentioned that the alliance, the treaty or the alliance uh, is in reference to the Pacific era, area. They don't mention just the Korean Peninsula. And so maybe for the Koreans back then, they thought it was really about the defense of our country. But for the United States, they had always considered the U.S.-South Korea alliance as part of a broader network of alliances, the alliance, U.S. alliance with Japan or with uh, the Philippines or with Australia and New Zealand. And so Korea was uh, one part of this broader uh, network. And so I think for the U.S. side, they had thought of the alliance as part of a broader network. But come 70 years later, I think now the Koreans now recognize that it's not just about the defense of the Korean Peninsula, but the U.S.-South Korea alliance has a much more regional role or focus. Now, I, the last point I mentioned was that there's always going to be issues of lingering trust. I'm going to save much of this for our uh, discussion with uh, Professor Peck and with Troy. Uh, but these are some of the lingering issues. There's something known as an Inflation Reduction Act. This is domestic politics in the US, but uh, Korea has um, a lot of, uh, has invested in the United States. And I know Troy will say more about this, but the US has, the Biden administration had made policies that have uh, been uh, in Koreans' minds harmful for their bottom line. So that's, there's an issue, there's issues of trust there. There's these lingering issues of, of trust related to extended deterrence, meaning that the United States guarantees that South Korea is part of the nuclear umbrella to protect South Korea from any nuclear attack. But sometimes South Koreans wonder whether the US will really um, protect them if there's a nuclear attack. So there are these issues of trust. And I'll just end by saying that uh, even when you cut, look at elections moving forward, one thing Koreans think about when they think of trust is in 2024, if there's a different president, well, the next president, or well, uh, this is all hypothetical, but um, if the front runner of the Republican Party becomes president, will that create more issues for uh, the U.S.-South Korea alliance? And, uh, and then on the domestic side for South Korea, of course, President Yoon's approval rating is quite low, so... There's also questions for the U.S. if if there's an, a, a new president, you know, three and a half years from now, will they make the same sorts of commitments? So um, I'll end there. Uh, I'll just say that there was a terrific summit meeting uh, in April 2023 between the presidents of the United States and South Korea. And I do think overall the alliance is in a very healthy state at its 70th anniversary. But I still think that there's going to be more work ahead. I'll pass it off now to Troy. Andrew, before we get Troy, mm -hmm. the, we were not able to see the PowerPoint slides you prepared. Were you going through the PowerPoint slides? Oh, I was. I thought I heard that. I, I was scrolling through them. I'm not sure why. OK. Uh, so maybe this is a new feature of the Zoom. And then I think that we are still in the learning process. OK. The, it said I was screen. It said I'm screen sharing now. And I just stopped the screen share. Uh, okay. But I guess it never popped up. Yeah, but it's okay. We were able to. Okay. To, to, okay. Okay. All right, Troy. Well, 
Dr. Peck, thank you for having me. It's always great to see you, and thank you for again having me. Uh, you are a very uh, frequent uh, <laughs> guest. <laughs> and you know, Andrew, it's always great to see you and be on a panel with yourself. And you know, I hadn't thought about that Asia Foundation trip for a long time, but um, you know, if I remember, I think that was also a relatively short trip. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, I think Andrew set the stage really well. Um, you know, he talked about how the alliance has changed as Korea has changed. And I think that that's one of the key points to take away from this relationship. And what I want to do is sort of talk about the origins of the relationship a little bit, Korea's own economic development and sort of how that's kind of changed our relationship with South Korea. So maybe flesh out a little bit of what Andrew's talked about. And, you know, October 1st marks the seventh anniversary of the U.S. Mutual Defense Treaty. And we often talk about the alliance in terms of it being a partnership forged in blood or that we're two countries who are blood brothers. But actually, U.S.-Korea relations go back further than that. Last year, I was in Seoul for an event to mark the 140th anniversary of the Treaty of Peace, Amity, Commerce, and Navigation between the United States and the then Chosun Dynasty. So much of our nation's history and what we talk about does date from just prior to the Korean War to today. But I think it's important to remember that this is a more diverse relationship that goes back further in history. And, you know, was I was sort of prepared for this and going back through some things I did before. If I remember correctly, I think the first effort in Congress to try and open relations with Korea actually dates back to the 1840s. Um, it wasn't until the 1870s when, um, you know, we actually tried to go out and establish relations with Korea. But this is something that has much deeper roots and goes back much further, I think, than we often talk about and realize. And, you know, in that context, you know, when we think about it from the Korean War perspective, you know, at the end of the war, Korea wasn't just war torn, but it was among the poorest countries in the world. The level of poverty was extremely harsh. Many children lived off powdered milk supplied with U.S. aid. The state of sanitation was so dire that children often had to be sprayed with DDT by American soldiers to kill lice. Um, during that period in the 1950s, South Korea was heavily reliant on foreign aid, which financed 70 percent of its imports. The majority of that came from the United States, though a small portion also came from the United Nations. And it had three main objectives, to prevent starvation and disease, to increase agricultural outputs, and to provide essential consumer goods for the population. And the situation, I think, when we think about South Korea and its own success story, is much more challenging than, you know, is often realized. What natural resources there are on the Korean Peninsula are in North Korea. Um, so the South lacked, you know, coal and some of the minerals that we often talk about the North Korea exporting to try and finance its own weapons programs. And so, you know, there was really concerns in the United States that, you know, South Korea would be dependent on it for the long term. Um, General Charles Hemlick, who was the deputy military governor of the U.S. occupation of forces at the end of World War II, uh, said that, you know, Korea can never attain a high standard of living. There are virtually no Koreans with technical training and experience required to take advantage of Korea's resources and affect improvement over its rice economy. And so there's other U.S. reports and things where there's sort of similar sentiments. And I think this kind of shows really how far Korea has come. And, you know, we talk about things like the miracle on the Han River and things, but I think it's important to keep in perspective, you know, just how far South Korea has come. Much of this change started happening in the 1960s and 70s when Korea moved from being a light manufacturer of wigs, toys, and other sort of light consumer goods to becoming an exporter, exporter of major heavy industrial goods such as steel and chemicals. Uh, and as Andrew mentioned, Korea's economic development would change its relationship with the United States. And so if we think about even just how this relationship shifted and how the trade relationship looked, between the period from 1965 to 1969, the U.S. was basically accounted for 45 percent of all of South Korea's imports. In the 70s, this started to tail off, but by the end of the uh, by the 80s, we go back up to about 40 percent as South Korea started moving into things like automobiles, integrated circuits and other types of uh, industrial goods. But for a long time, the United States was a key and important trading partner for, for South Korea and if not the most important. Now, over the last two decades or so, China has sort of replaced that role with the U.S. becoming the second most important trading partner for South Korea. But it's a deep economic relationship that goes back many years and is shifted as South Korea itself has shifted. Um, as Andrew mentioned, we eventually we get past the Asian financial crisis and 
South Korea is looking to try and really institutionalize economic reforms to move its economy forward. And so it puts in an effort to try and take and reach a free trade agreement with the United States. One, to take and lock in economic reforms domestically, but two, to also lock in duty-free access to the U.S. market. And so in 2007, Korea and the United States finalized negotiations of the core FTA, but political concerns of the United States related to automobiles and beef hauled the passage of the agreement. And one way to think about this is, you know, this gets into U.S. domestic politics. If you go back to that time period, the chair of the Senate um, Finance Committee, which is the committee that oversees uh, trade issues, was from Montana. If you go back and you look at the House Ways and Means Committee, which oversees trade in the House, the chairperson was from the state of Michigan. And at this period, both a Republican and a Democrat held that spot, and both were from Michigan. And the key thing to keep in mind here is that historically, there were certain issues that the United States, in terms of trade, had challenges with in South Korea. One was beef. After a BSE incident in the United States, Korea essentially stopped imports. And so getting those restarted was important for Chairman Bacchus, who's from Montana, whose country, or excuse me, whose state exported a lot of beef to South Korea. And at the same time, there's been difficulty selling U.S. automobiles in South Korea. And so when you have the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee from Michigan, you have the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee from Montana, these are two of the most difficult sticking issues in the economic relationship. It's somewhat understandable why the agreement sort of came to a halt and had to be go through additional negotiation to try and address these issues. By 2012, we had bridged these differences. Um, to be honest, North Korea's nuclear test somewhat helped on this. Uh, President Obama, uh, after one of the North Korean nuclear tests, decided he wanted to take and strengthen the relationship with South Korea, and he saw this is one way to do it by trying to finally move this forward despite having come into office, not necessarily being overly supportive of free trade himself. And ultimately, the course FTA will, when it's fully implemented, remove tariffs on 95% of trade between the United States and Korea, with a major exemption, which is rice, which is exempted from the agreement. Now, how has this relationship changed? And Andrew has sort of hinted at some of this, but because Korea is now not only one of the world's largest economies, both in terms of GDP, where it tends to fluctuate between the 10th and the 12th largest economy in the world, um, but also it's a key player in certain industries. Samsung and SK Hynix, along with the US firm Micron, dominate the memory chip industry. Um, outside of China, um, there are only two companies that produce solar cells that are in the top 10. One is First Solar in the United States. The other is Hanwha uh, Q Cells, a South Korean firm. And if you look at EV batteries, Panasonic is an important player in Japan, but again, outside of Chinese firms, South Korean firms tend to be key players. And so as we look at a more technologically based future, dealing with AI, and also simply, you know, in terms of military technology, and as you look towards the transition to climate change, Korea has become a key and critical partner for the United States. And we've seen this shift in recent years as the relationship has begun specifically under President Biden to focus more on tech cooperation um, and economic issues. And if you go back to the first um, summit meeting between President Biden and then President Moon Jae-in of South Korea, you'll notice a shift how North Korea isn't necessarily the dominant issue in the relationship. It's climate change, it's technology, it's supply chains. It's these types of things that are becoming an important part of the relationship. Um, so speaking of climate change, as I mentioned, um, Korea is a key player both in solar panels, in terms of not just EVs, but EV batteries. Um, if we look at the United States and its own transition to EVs, most of the batteries that are going to be produced in the United States will be either produced by Korean firms in their own investments in the U.S. or in joint ventures, um, similar to one in my home state between Ford and SK Hynix. Um, to build a new battery and EV facility in western Tennessee and in Kentucky. Um, at the same time, uh, this relationship is also beyond simply climate change and semiconductors. It's one, as Andrew mentioned, that's really looking farther. So whether it's working together in the G20 or other international organizations, whether it's bilaterally, 
Korea is an important partner for the United States today, both in terms of the fight against climate change, taking and developing technology and ensuring it's regulated properly, and in key future areas such as artificial intelligence. Um, next year, South Korea is going to host the second major international conference on, in essence, the ethical use of AI in um, the military domain. And so it's playing an important role today. And it's playing this role because not only is military power underpinned by a country's economic power, but Korea isn't simply a large economy, it has excelled in many of the key areas that are important for the modern economy and for technology going forward. And with that, uh, Dr. Peck, I'd be glad to take and uh, move into the discussion period. Sure. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, both of you, for your informative presentation. Now I'd like to ask you a few questions related to the key issues each of you addressed before we take questions from the floor or the audience. Audience, if you'd like to submit questions, uh, please click on the questions button at the bottom of your screen. So both of you mentioned the partnership between the two countries no longer limited to security or defense issues. However, as Andrew mentioned, I think the security issue is still the bedrock or the centerpiece of the alliance due to the growing nuclear threat from North Korea. Since the failure of the Hanoi summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un in 2019, North Korea has accelerated its efforts to develop new nuclear weapon programs to pressure the U.S. to make concessions first and accept the declaration of the official end of the Korean War. As Andrew mentioned, it is still a truce or they just signed the armistice, so the war is still going on. In the face of increased threat from North Korea, a majority of South Korean people believe that probably the most effective way to contain North Korea's nuclear threat is to develop its own nuclear weapons. To appease the growing concern about the so-called nuclear umbrella, President Biden and Yoon adopted a new joint statement called the Washington Declaration at the end of the summit meeting last April. Andrew, can you explain the key points, key ingredients of Washington de Declaration and how effective this extensive nuclear deterrent could be in preventing nuclear war in Korean Peninsula? Yeah, just for our listeners who don't know the context, in 2022, or since 2022, North Korea has lobbed uh, anywhere between 120 to 130 missiles of various ranges. So this is very threatening to South Korea. And so some North Koreans say, well, the U.S.-South Korea alliance is not enough. We can only take security into our own hands. And they're saying the only way to really ensure nuclear deterrence is for us Koreans to get our own nuclear weapons. So that's very concerning to the U.S. Uh, if we see one of our allies getting nuclear weapons. And so to try to reassure Koreans that Koreans keep telling the U.S., you know, what are you going to do to protect us? Because North Korea keeps uh, developing more missiles that they might conduct a seventh nuclear test. And so the U.S. finally said in the last you know, Biden Yoon summit in April through this Washington declaration that we will guarantee that, well, one is we'll guarantee extended deterrence. We will guarantee your security. But to do that, we'll come up with this uh, group called the Nuclear uh, Consultative Group that will discuss any uh, that will discuss any nuclear matters with you so that you understand where we're at. Um, the Washington Declaration also committed to provide uh, more commitments. So things like nuclear submarines will ne are now going to visit U.S. nuclear submarines will visit the peninsula more regularly. And uh, they'll just periodically demonstrate that we have these nuclear assets like bombers, U.S. bombers, nuclear uh, strategic bombers that are flying on the peninsula. In return, though, the South Koreans said in this Washington Declaration that we would adhere to our commitment to the non-proliferation regime, meaning that South Koreans won't try to pursue the bomb on their own. So for now, it seems like uh, the South Korean government at least feels uh, somewhat reassured by the steps that the U.S. has taken uh, through this Washington Declaration to, uh, to assure their um, uh, protection or guarantee. So that's what the Washington Declaration is about. It's really a guarantee that the U.S. will protect South uh, Korea from a nuclear attack and that the new North South Koreans won't uh, go nuclear on their own. Thanks for your explanation. Do you think that the Korean people will really buy this, you know, the the argument or <laughs> explanation about that, you know, the exchange of these sort of what uh, obligations uh, between the two countries? 
it depends who you ask, I guess. But I think for the most part, I mean, Koreans, and Troy may actually have polling data. I know there's been polling done. Uh, I think people find the U.S.-South Korea line satisfactory in terms of they, they understand or they know that the U.S. is also implicated in any kind of attack. It's a credibility problem for the United States, too, if they do nothing, if, if they just stand aside if the North Koreans invade. So I do think that they'll protect um, the South Koreans believe what the United States say, but that's why I mean by these uh, undercurrents of angst or doubt in this in this article that they wrote. But they just keep seeing the situation with North Korea getting worse, and so they want to be fully uh, they want to fully ensure that they're protected. So the best insurance they think is getting the nuclear weapons. But they know that that would uh, upset the U.S. That could create uh, that could trigger. Um, pro, uh, nuclear proliferation within Northeast Asia and beyond. So that's just a route that you don't want to go. It can open up a whole new can of worms and troubles. So I think for now, and this is my own personal view, that I, I think that the South Koreans are reassured. But if North Korea were to conduct a seventh nuclear test, that they were to cause more trouble, right. maybe the South Koreans may feel nervous once again. So we'll have to see. Yeah. All right, well, thanks. Yeah, One thing I'd add briefly is, um, so my colleague, Carl Friedhoff, he does a lot of polling in South Korea, and they're in the process of doing a new survey, which isn't out yet, um, but they did one a year or two ago, they sort of looked at this, and they asked the question, basically, you know, if South Korea faced sanctions or something else, would you still support a nuclear weapon, or South Korea getting a nuclear weapon? Um, those numbers go down, but they don't go below 50%. Mm -hmm. um, I have talked with him, and I'm not sure if he's going to do this, but, you know, the question that I've asked, because we do some polling as well, and I often look at polling data out of South Korea, and if you look at South Korean presidential elections, North Korea tends to be the fifth, sixth most important issue. So I also kind of am curious, like, okay, polls say 70% of South Koreans would support a nuclear weapon, but how important really is this for them? And so... Um, he may look into that deeper question, but I do think there's one problem, and I'm just going to share my screen very quickly, uh, yeah. that in essence we might have, which is that in the United States there is potential for, um, for some reason I do not see it on my uh, screen, but in essence I'll just tell you, uh, the polling data, you don't really need to see it. We asked the question of Americans, you know, which countries should be able to have nuclear capabilities on the military side. And basically, 42% last year said no country should be able to have nuclear weapons. Um, those numbers in the forthcoming survey that we have coming out go up. Um, and so I do think there's this disconnect in that in South Korea, there is this move towards or feeling that perhaps we need nuclear weapons to where the United States, at least on a public level, there is a sense that we need to get rid of these weapons, especially because of the Ukraine war. And so I think this could be a point of division within the alliance of the future. And so that does concern me. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's move to the next question. Um, I prepared a, lot of, prepared a lot of questions, but at the same time, I also want to ask you to entertain the questions from the audience. So the next question I have is uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un visited Russia and met Putin uh, about two, e two weeks ago, right, uh, to discuss a deal involving weapons technologies and supplies of munition to support the Russian war with the Ukraine. On the other hand, a trilateral summit meeting between the US, Japan, and Korean leaders uh, was held in Camp David in August to expand their security alliance. How likely do you think this mini lateral you know, now this is a new term. I think they're getting more popularity uh, instead of plurilateral or multilateral. Minilateral platform between the two blocks, namely, you know, US, Japan, and Korea versus um, Russia, uh, China, and North Korea will trigger a larger scale new Cold War beyond the US and China confrontation. Sure, I, I can uh, take that one. So. In terms of these mini laterals, so if, it's not just the U.S., Japan, Korea trilateral. So that's one, I guess it's, it's an effort by the U.S. and the Biden administration to try to connect the dots among their alliances. So it's like you have these networks and you want to expand or enlarge in these networks by not just creating bilateral alliances, but uh, linking 
the alliance partners together. So you have US, Japan, Korea, you have something called the Quad, which is um, US, Japan, India, Australia, and then something called AUKUS, the Australia, uh, U United Kingdom, United States. It's a trilateral that works on, uh, it's a security agreement, but a focus is on uh, ensuring that Australians get a nuclear submarine. But these are all these mini laterals that you mentioned. And so all of these in total, one can argue is really um, making China and Russia feel nervous. They feel that they're being encircled. That's the rhetoric that Beijing and um, Beijing and Moscow are using and also North Korea. So these days, because of the Ukraine war, because of political alignments among Beijing, uh, Beijing, Pyongyang and Moscow, some assume that we're seeing this access and that this access between those three countries. And so we're going to see a clash. I don't think it's I, I definitely think that these countries, especially uh, China and Russia, are concerned about the tightening of U.S. alliances uh, through these mini laterals. But we have to remember that there is no formal alliance between these other three countries, China and Russia and North Korea. Um, so uh, and, and I also think that. Uh, it's, I mean, it could be seen as the other way around. It's because of North Korea's own threats that that's what's pushing Korea and Japan together, or that's what's encouraging US, Japan, Korea trilateralism. So I, I don't see this as uh, promoting a, a new type of Cold War. I think that the tensions have been rising, that's for sure. But whether we're seeing like two different systems develop or form uh, because of you know something like the Camp David, you know, the spirit of Camp David agreement and the trilateral summit. I don't think, in, in my view, I don't think that's the impetus. If there is a new Cold War that's brewing, it goes much deeper than just the creation of these uh, mini laterals. Roy, do you want to add I, anything? I agree with everything that Andrew said. And, you know, I think when we look at this dynamic at play, um, you know, Andrew highlighted the role North Korea is playing. Right now, Japan faces a threat from North Korea. You have the United States facing a threat now with ICBMs. And so I really think, you know, China will talk a lot about how, well, we use that as an excuse to really try and, you know, put more pressure on China. But the reality is, is that the North Korean threat, you know, is growing. It's something that's felt, you know, not just in South Korea, but elsewhere. And so I think it's somewhat rational that in the absence of the North Koreans being willing to come to the table and at a minimum perhaps take in cap or scale back some of their weapons programs, that these tensions are going to likely increase. Yeah. Can I just add, I actually thought that the Chinese, like a year ago, that the Chinese would tell the North Koreans to cool it or to like stop firing missiles because that's what's bringing together Japan, Korea, and the United States. Um, so in some ways, it's North Korea's provocations that are creating this tightening of, at least on, on the U.S., Japan, Korea side for Northeast Asia. I think that's the immediate impetus. So if China wanted to do something constructive and get the alliance to not tighten so much, uh, they would tell North Koreans to stop firing these missiles. So um, that's that's a different angle, a different way of putting it. So uh, that doesn't mean that the tensions aren't brewing. T definitely tensions are brewing. but. To right. say that it's created because of these mini laterals, I think that's that's more right. that's the narrative that China and you know North Korea and Russia may put out. Well, we all know that the, both the U.S. and South Korea, um, they keep asking China to play a much bigger role, you know, to curb that the the, the intention, uh, you know, desire of the uh, North Korea uh, to develop that the larger scale that the you know nuclear power. Okay, the last question related to the uh, security issue uh, is the one that, you know, we know that next year is the very important year in the U.S. It's an election year. Uh, some people raise concern about the sustainability of the visible efforts and strengthening deterrence against North Korea in the long run. Do you expect any changes in the U.S. commitment to strong military alliance and also other strategic alliance between the two countries, depending upon the presidential election outcome in the U.S. Yeah, so I mean, if you already alluded, kind of, you know. Yeah, well, 
in, in 2024, if it's if we have another Biden administration, then no, we'll probably continue the you know similar similar line of policy track that we're going right now. I think we can just say the name, but like the, if I mean, I know there are people that don't want to say the T word, but uh, Trump is right now leading in all the polls. So let's just say that Trump becomes president. You know, what's that going to do to the alliance? Um, I think I may be in a minority voice. I there's definitely going to be changes, um, and I, I'll say what those changes are in terms of foreign policy and specifically the alliance. We know that he doesn't uh, he doesn't care for alliances like the way the uh, Biden administration does. That he thinks that our allies should do more. That we're paying too much. Um, but I think there's going to be more continuity than we assume so on on the economic fronts so when it comes to things like economic security and like the export controls that are, are levied against china that you know and then allies having to follow suit um i think those are going to be similar because trump also sees china as a worrisome player and he, if he, and biden has not been i mean they've been pretty strong on and on china i think and i think that's something that the trump administration will continue mm -hmm. um the using X, so Americans are using economic coercion as well, too, I suppose. Um, but it's against China. I think Trump will continue on that track to some degree. Ironically, I think on the security front, we may see some uh, differences. So one thing we know is that Trump doesn't like spending money and things like having large scale joint military exercises that cost money or sending strategic like bombers or submarines like these deployments, those all cost money. So there's a possibility that Trump may say, yeah, these cost too much, so let's not do it. Or he may start talking about, you know, reducing the number of, of U.S. troops. And this is what makes Koreans very nervous because we're doing these things right now because we want to reassure the South Koreans and we don't want South Koreans for them to go nuclear on their own. Mm -hmm. right. But if Trump says we're not going to do these things anymore because they cost too much, I think that might make Koreans a bit more nervous. And then, then the Koreans will have to look at some other option because they'll see the U.S., especially under the Trump administration, is not being uh, not being all that reassuring that they're not they may not U.S. may not defend us. So we have to find our own form of security. So I think that's that may be some of the implications of a of a, you know, a Trump, okay. uh, a Trump to. Uh, right. Well, I want to move to the questions related to economic issues. Uh, so Detroit, uh, you mentioned that since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act in August 2020, uh, South Korea has invested more in the U.S. than any other country, and, and it is a critical partner in the production of EV batteries, as you mentioned. As you well may well know, the Hyundai become the world's third largest automaker by volume trailing behind only Toyota and Volkswagen as of last year, thanks to a strong performance of their EVs. However, IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, made buyers of EVs assembled outside North America no longer claim the $7,500 tax credit. South Korean government and auto manufacturers, both Hyundai and Kia, are very unhappy about the exclusion of Korean automobiles from receiving this subsidy. Is this a done deal or they're still subject to negotiation? So prior to uh, President Yoon's summit uh, earlier this year in the U.S., the bilateral, not the trilateral with uh, Prime Minister Kishida, the Biden administration implemented the rules for the Inflation Reduction Act. And one of the things they did, which was a suggestion put forward by South Korea and I think also uh, the European Union, was to take and allow for leased vehicles to take and qualify for the 7,500 tax credit. So rather than a direct sale, if Hyundai or Kia leases a vehicle, and this goes under the commercial uh, vehicle provision within the Inflation Reduction Act, they can pass that savings along to consumers. And so what we've seen as a result of that is that in essence, uh, and I was looking at the most recent data recently because we tracked this. Um, Hyundai and Kia as a combined entity, because they are one company in South Korea, um, right. is actually the largest, the second largest seller behind Tesla of EVs in the United States. Right. Um, their EV sales in the second quarter were 11% above the second quarter last year before the Inflation Reduction Act came out. So. I realize that there's still probably concerns and some of these will relate to the provisions on battery content and mineral content in batteries going forward. Uh, but 
you know, I think the biggest issue has been resolved through the leasing provisions. Um, Hyundai and Kia are both doing very well, contrary to some of the initial changes when the act first came in, when you did see a decrease in sales and that shifted. And so I think we're in a good place on this issue for the most part now. Okay. Uh, my last question before I take a question, uh, Professor Sun Lee, uh, the U.S. seeks to better link supply chains with allies and bring back more manufacturing to America. Uh, both of you mentioned this is the another you know the dimension of strategic alliance that uh, global sourcing uh, supply chain. Uh, the Chip Four initiative is a good example of this minilateral strategic alliance to secure economic security that includes the U.S., South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan, the major suppliers of chips, to improve its access to chip, uh, vital chips and weaken Chinese involvement on trade and national security reasons. Do you expect this alliance will be successfully implemented despite some ongoing tensions between Korea and Japan? and as well as the U.S. and Korea regarding EV tax credit? So I think on CHIPS4, whether this becomes a more formal, specific working group or it remains sort of a looser grouping, it makes sense for the United States, Japan, and Korea to work together on semiconductors. It also makes sense to bring the European Union in. If we think about the way semiconductors are produced and you know, when we talk about supply chain issues and everything, iPhones tend to be the classic example that everyone likes to use, so I'll stick with that. Um, Apple tends to rotate in and out who they get their memory chips from, but Samsung and SK Hynix have both in the past and in the current model when uh, YMTC couldn't step forward to provide chips to a Chinese company, Samsung is believed to have been the replacement. And so what uh, happens is to make the semiconductors, you need inputs, specific chemicals, which are done to a certain degree. The Jap Japanese companies specialize in these types of chemicals, and they provide most of them to Samsung, I say Hynix, and other companies around the world. The ultraviolet lithography equipment comes from the Netherlands. Without that, you can't do chips like Samsung and SK Hynix and uh, TSMC do that are three nanometers and below, and even, I think, anything below six nanometers. And so you need each of these components coming from specific places. And so for security reasons, they need to take and cooperate. And one of the reasons why they need to cooperate, and this gets into the supply chain side of things, is those inputs often require inputs from China to produce. So hydrogen fluoride, one of the chemicals that Japan uh, refines to a high purity level, the base ingredients for that come from China. And so Japanese companies are dependent upon China for those inputs. And so trying to develop new sources for that is going to be important. And so as we take and do move into greater competition with China, and as we do try to place security restrictions on China's access to certain semiconductor technologies, it's going to be important for Taiwan, for Japan, South Korea, the United States, and even the EU to work together to try and not totally, because you don't want to remove everything from China because there's economic reasons, there's geopolitical reasons to maintain a footprint in China, but to take and try and lessen that dependence and find new sources. And so I think whether it's formally through CHIP4 or informally through some other forum, I think we're going to continue to see cooperation amongst right. all of those groupings or countries in the EU. All right, thanks. Um, you know, we are almost running out of time. Uh, there's only one question from the audience, so I think it's important. That, so I will read the question. On top of the various current efforts from both countries, what specific initiatives or collaboration can businesses, organizations, and universities on both sides undertake to enhance technological innovation and knowledge exchange within the U.S.-Korea alliance, thereby fostering economic growth and competitiveness for both nations? So, I think this is actually a really good question. It's important. Um, you know, one, we've seen a lot about um, generative AI, so ChatGPT and other things. Right. Um, there's clearly flaws in it. We need regulations. You know, part of that is going to be the private sector, perhaps mm -hmm. not self-regulating, but stepping forward with some good ideas on how we regulate that. But also, we've talked about climate change. And so some of the technologies out there are still nascent. It's going to require investment. And so this means governments investing in R&D, uh, so companies can then take and try and commercialize that technology. And there's certain things like 
in the area of hydrogen. The electrolyzers that are going to be needed if we're going to take and try and harness hydrogen as a fuel source, they need to become cheaper, they need to become more efficient, and all of these are the type of industrial processes that South Korea, Japan are very good at working at. And so we need to see more collaboration between companies who have the tech and companies who are very good at taking and basically doing this type of commercialization, doing these cost reductions, working together to maximize these technologies. Now, the challenges and everything, you know, everyone wants to make sure that they're the ones that benefit. So we have to find mutually beneficial partnerships because no one will want, say, for example, a U.S. company to give a Korean company technology and the Korean company to make all the money if they're able to take and you know, improve efficiency or reduce costs. But these are the kind of areas we need to look at. Where are the gaps in our technology? Where are the gaps in our regulation? And how can we kind of come together, you know, either through new research at universities, new research at the corporate level, um, new ideas at think tanks. You know, this is where Andrew and I come in of how do we take and put forward ideas of how we can really make these kinds of things work. But I mean, I think there's a lot of areas, both on the technology side, the climate side, and others to really work together and try and not only boost our economies, but boost our efficiency and our supply chain resiliency. Can I just add what Troy said? Because I do think there is both the political will in both Korea and the United States to try to uh, strengthen initiatives in the STEM fields. When President Yoon uh, came to Washington as part of their uh, joint statement, they talked about uh, you know STEM programs and uh, there is new money that was put in for educational exchanges. I think $60 million that's going to fund, it was very symbolic, said, 2023, so 20, uh, 2023 Koreans, 2023 Americans um, to uh, do these cross uh, you know, exchanges. I think the difficulty is getting more Americans to come to Korea. I think there's plenty of Koreans uh, in the science and STEM that are coming to the United States, but they want to work together in the, they've created a Fulbright. I, I remember there was an announcement that they've created like the largest Fulbright program for STEM programs uh, so that uh, they can bring Koreans to the U.S. and vice versa. So the idea is that there is political will uh, in trying to boost cooperation at the level of universities and businesses um, and, and to promote you know, academic exchanges, uh, specifically on science and technology, because the U.S. recognizes that you know, Korea is definitely a leader in this area, in this space. Um, and, and there's just more, there's uh, just room and potential for more cooperation and collaboration on that front. So uh, I agree with what Troy said, but I just want to mention that uh, watch out because I think uh, there's money that that's out there and LMU or maybe other universities could take advantage of these programs that are being uh, being generated. I'll just end by saying when I was visiting MOFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Korea, the I mean, this is, these are folks who do public diplomacy, but they were also asking me, you know, we have lots of exchanges among scholars, you know, people who do political science and international relations like you to do these programs, but how can we promote that? Like when it comes to other fields like engineering or science. So definitely I know South Korea is thinking about, you know, how to uh, improve engagement uh, with the United States on science and technology issues. Mm -hmm. And just very briefly, one other area, and this was actually from the trilateral is, we're trying to encourage increased cooperation between our national laboratories as well to try and bring you know, the best scientific minds we have together. That's good. All right. Uh, thanks again, Troy and Andrew, for talking to LMD community today out of your very busy schedule. I know that you're in the East Coast, so uh, we really appreciate your comprehensive and insightful analysis of the US and Korea strategic alliance um, covering the new dimensions. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program, and we'll be back with another program in October. Please stay safe and healthy until then. Before you leave, I really appreciate it if you could uh, complete a brief survey at the end of this webinar. Again, thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you. Thank you.